Hey, thank you for joining us online today. We hope that this message challenges you and encourages you to experience Jesus together. If you would like to give, you can visit our website at www.hillcrestchurch.info and download our app for a fast, secure, and easy way to give. Aloha kakahiaka. That goes out to my uh, Kohala family that I just saw. I got, I got friends from where I lived before we moved here in the house today. That's crazy. Such a small world, man. So cool. So cool. Uh, you guys got to hear the youth band. Yes, that's how it sounds on Sunday night. Actually, it's louder on Sunday night. Um, we like to push it to like beyond the, the normal level. We like it to shake. It, it's loud in here on Sunday night. Um, but that was my son on the guitar. That was his first time playing a Sunday morning on the guitar, and he's been he's been killing it. Uh, but yeah, youth night is super fun. I'm the youth pastor. Just started a couple months back. Uh, so if you are a teenager, there is something happening Sunday night. It is a little different than before. Yes, we do ransack the church. Yes, we do hit each other with dodgeballs. Yes, we do have message. Yes, we have small groups. Yes, there is the word, okay? It is, it's not all fun and games. There is food. So if you do want to come, you adults are welcome as well to come check it out. If you ever are not busy on a Sunday night, I want to see what youth is all about. Normally, there's fun uh, lighting and everything. The stage is completely different. Uh, it's a fully different setup, but it's super, super dope. So here's your invitation to come to, to youth on Sunday night. Check it out. If you're a teenager, come check it out. I promise it's fun, okay? Okay. Um, if you're not a teenager, you can volunteer with me, and we can have a lot of fun together. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care. The kids don't care either. Kids don't care how old you are. They care how much you care about them. And so if you're here and you want to build a relationship with teenagers, they're super cool. They need a lot of guidance. And all the parents of teenagers said, amen. Uh, I can say that three times because I have three of them, and they all need a lot of help. And so if you want to come down, hang out with teens, you're welcome to. Just come see me after. Um, and if you are a teenager, I want to invite you Sunday nights from 6 to 8.30. It's a good time. You can come party with us uh, and have a good time. Cool. Uh, before we get started, I got told before, we got a big family from Guam in the back row. They take up the back two sections. Uh, yeah. But they are the island of Guam, not them themselves. But Guam is is under Typhoon Watch. Uh, and so I got asked if we could say a prayer for Guam before we get started. And so, uh, oh, am I preaching too long already? <laughs> my bad, guys. My, my, my bad. Um, but it, I don't know where Guam is located, but I know where Vince them are, and Vince and his family. If you guys can just stand, we're just going to raise our hands towards you. They have family back home uh, that are preparing, and we just want to pray for God's protection and peace over them. If you guys could stretch your hands towards Vince and his family. God, this morning, we know that you control the storms, the wind, the waves. We know that you are powerful. We know that you protect. We know that you can do what nobody else can do. And so, God, we just pray over Guam right now as they are prepar preparing for a typhoon. Um, we just pray that everybody stays safe, one. But I also pray that you just blow that thing out. Like, you, you can make it move. So we'll just put our faith there. That you, would, that you would protect the island and the families of Guam today. God, we pray for peace on Vince and his family as they have family back home. Um, we just pray for comfort on them, and we pray that they would stay in constant communication with their family, that you would keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, homies, now we're going to get started. So if you have never heard me before, you might want to turn your ears up and because uh, I talk fast. Because I am from Hawaii, that's how we do, that's how we communicate. So I'm going to talk fast. If you don't know what I'm saying, you can go ask my friends from Kohala in the back. They'll interpret for you later. Uh, this is what he meant. It's good, it's good. So we are in this series called To My Former Self. And uh, we are, if I had a chance to go back in time, I remember Brian was saying, if we had a time machine and could go back in time and talk to our former 25-year-old self, what would we say? And I have a lot to say to that guy. I don't know if you are that, that way too. You have a lot to say. I'm only 40. That was only 15 years ago for me, but I have a lot to say to that guy. A uh, little bit of backstory for myself. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, much like Tammy. We knew church in and out. 
uh, my dad started our church on the big island in Kona when I was eight years old. Um, so I was, I was thrust into ministry at eight, okay? Uh, and that was set up, tear down. Make, that's why I make us set up and tear down youth night every, it's just my roots. That's how I was raised. We just set up, tear down every Sunday. We, were, we met in a little hotel room there, little ballroom that sat 25 people. My job was to wheel down speakers at eight years old and help plug in and set up the sound system. That was my job. Then we would hang out, hand out donuts to first-time visitors. We were trying to entice them to church, right? If you can't invite them and they, and they come, then you entice them with donuts. That's just how it works. And so we would entice them to come to church with donuts. Uh, and, and we would play music and whatever. I would run the transparency machine back in the day. Uh, so I would be the little kid in the front row dancing around with the transparency upside down. That was me. Uh, you couldn't follow along with the words because you couldn't read them. They were upside down and backwards uh, because, you know, uh, just as long as they were on there, it's good, right? For those of you that have kids, you know that that's how it goes. It's close. It's almost there, but not quite there. So, you know, a kid is running things. And so grew up eight years old. I did that, served in, served in kids ministry with my mom, uh, born and raised in the church, served in youth ministry with my brother when I turned 17. We started our youth church. That's, that became the new term. It was no longer youth group. It was youth church. Uh, that was the thing as soon as 180 came out. I don't know if you've ever heard of that church in Oklahoma. A little small thing they got going on there with Willie George. Uh, super tiny. They, they, they need some help there. But they started this whole youth church revolution. And so we started with, that's where I learned how to play the drums and bang them really loud because we liked rock music. When Hillsong United came out, they changed the face of youth music. And so I did that, served there from 17. At 25, 24, I met my wife. Woo! At 24, we dated for six months. hey -o. Got married. No, it was not a shotgun marriage, okay? Everybody asks. That wasn't the case, okay? Uh, before, we, before we went on our first date, we both had a list of what we wanted. The, like what we want, what we were looking for, right? Uh, mine was I was done playing games. I, I hated dating. Dating was terrible, you know, because you never know what, what you're going to get, right? You never know. You never can tell. They can be crazy. And so I, I was looking for, for somebody to marry. I didn't want to date around. I was tired of that. She already had my oldest son, Broden. She got pregnant with him at 20. So she was 22 at the time, already had Broden when we met. She wasn't looking to date either. She was looking for a husband and a father, right? So we met first date we, we laid it all out that was our first date conversation if this isn't where you're headed why waste time and that was her thing to me that wasn't me to her that was she was like if you're gonna waste my time get lost right and I was like no no like seriously we'll get married two months later so we went on our first date in April April 26 we celebrate that every year we go on our first date again and again every year we, we mark it on the calendar April 26 it's coming up date night our one date a year besides our anniversary. Um, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. So April 26 rolls around. July, I propose. August, we get married. That fast. Bang, bang, bang. May of 2007, I get blessed with Jedediah. If you've not met Jedediah, you're not missing anything. He doesn't like to talk to you anyway. It's fine. You look at him like, what's up, bro? He's like, and then he just walk away. Um, it's cool. He's awesome. But instant. That was 24. I turned 25. I'm a father and a husband, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a, I'm a videographer for my dad, video editor for my dad at his church on staff. I'm his graphic designer. I'm the middle school pastor. I'm his drummer. I'm getting paid a measly $14 an hour in Hawaii, right? How many of you in Hawaii, you know that you can survive on 14 an hour, right? A family of four? No, you can't. No. But I remember at 24, going to 25, my marriage was in shambles. I didn't know how to be a dad. I didn't know how to be a, a husband, right? Because I went from single to instant family. Didn't know how to do any of it. I remember being stuck in my brother and my dad's shadow. I remember being easily manipulated, thinking that it was Christianity. I don't know if you've ever been there. They can, they can quote the Bible at you all day to guilt trip you into something that you really aren't called to do or qualified to do. We can do it all day long. I also remember being 25 or before that, being able to play the church game. You know what the church game is? 
You know when to sit. You know when to stand. You know when to shout amen. You know when to raise your hands. You know when to close your eyes. You know when to feel the Spirit. You know how to say hallelujah. You know, you know God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. You know all the lingo. That was me growing up. I knew how to play the game. I started playing drums so I could check out the new girls that came to church. That was my whole goal. I knew how to play the system. Right? Oh, look at that boy. He's so holy in the drum set. Oh, my gosh. That young boy back there. Yeah, I'm raising my hands like, Chee, there, beep, there's one. Oh, yeah, chee, there's one. A lot to say to that young man. Didn't know what he was doing. Church was just a thing I did. It was a place I went to. It was a routine I was in. And back when I was 25, bro, we had church like every day. Do you guys remember those days? Sunday night, Sunday, three services on a Sunday morning, one service Sunday night, Tuesday night prayer meeting, Wednesday night midweek service, Thursday night Bible study, Friday night youth, Saturday night service. I was at, I basically lived at the church. And all the time, I had to be there. You had to be there. You're on staff. You don't have a choice. I didn't realize that saying yes to ministry made me a slave to the church. So I instantly started resenting the church. I was living a life, playing the game, looking the part. Everybody thought that I was holy, but on the inside, I was just buying time. And I don't know if any of you have been there. I'm going to be as open and honest with you as I can today. Is that cool? At 25 years old, I remember it was still a game. At 25 years old, even into marriage, not knowing what it meant to be a husband, I was still living the single life. We got into many a fight, many a fights, and it's not because of my wife, it's because of me. I was so self-centered, so self-involved, didn't care about others. Some of y'all are like, what? I know. Some of y'all see some of the finished products now of things that had to change back then. To my former self at 25, but I said, bro, it's not all about that, man. You know the Bible in and out. You've been here for a long time. But it wasn't about applying the word. It's about just showing up. And some of you are just there, just showing up, doing your thing, because that's what we do on Sundays. We go to church. Some of you young kids, you don't understand it right now why your daddy or your mommy drives you to church, drags you to church. It's because if you would not just listen, but apply the word, their whole goal for you is to be better than themselves. Their whole hope is that you would go further, that you would be stronger, that you'd be more equipped, that you would have more value, that you'd be able to stand on a firm foundation, which that's what the word is. And a lot of times we don't get it. When I was younger, I didn't get it. I didn't get the meaning of having to be at church, of wanting to be at church. I didn't get it. I wasn't there yet. I was going through the motions. I was like, yep, yeah, it's Sunday morning. I got to be there at 5.30 for sound check. I go bang on some drums. The songs that we played today, that's how we started our church every morning. At 5.30 in the morning, y'all. Good thing we're in industrial park, right? Nobody cared. Nobody was there. 5.30 in the morning, I was driving myself crazy on the drum set. So loud. Going through the motions. Just a routine. If I could tell my former self anything, it'd be this. In Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Because it's not just a game. It's not just a game. Sorry, I gotta pull up my fancy Bible here on my phone. Oh no. Did we get it on the screens? Hey, you guys are the best. All right, it says this in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him, but this is the part that I would tell myself, you need to apply. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We always hear in church that God has a plan for you, that there is a will of God for your life. There's something that he has in store for you. 
and a lot of times we, we try to figure out what that thing is. Well, what is God's plan for me? Any, anybody ever hear that? God has a plan for you, but what is it? Anybody have that question? Well, what is it? What is God's plan for me? And back then, God had a plan for me. I didn't know that, in, that three years later, my brother would move to start a church in Oahu, and I'd get thrust into being the senior youth pastor at our church. I didn't know that a couple years after that, I would take over as senior pastor at a church in Kohala on Javi Road. I had no clue. I had no clue at 25. I was too busy doing my own thing, too busy conforming to the world's way of doing things in church, at a very worldly perspective in church. What can I do to manipulate somebody to get what I want but use the Bible to get it? What can I do to be the biggest jerk face at our youth night to teens that are coming there that have no clue about Jesus? I had the very wrong perspective at 25 years old. Everything was about me. And I look back at that, at that young man at 25, and I'm like, bro, I'm so disappointed in my decision. I'm so disappointed at the way that I handled myself, at the way I conducted myself, at the way I treated my wife and my kids, at the way that I treated the church that I was in, at the way that I served and lived. I'm so disappointed in that guy because I was too busy conforming and not doing enough transforming. Conforming is this way. Conforming is if I had a piece of tinfoil, I would show you. Tinfoil, when you put it over something, it conforms to whatever you put it over, right? It takes on that shape, right? You ever cover anything with tinfoil? Like a turkey? You cover a turkey with tinfoil? It's the worst, right? The leg pokes through. It's crazy. But normally, whatever you put over with the tinfoil, it conforms to that shape. It takes on that shape. A transforming, it's like Transformers. Super easy to think about, right? The movie. Right? Optimus Prime. I love Optimus Prime. Right? Come on now. For those of you that grew up in the 80s, Transformers was everything. The only thing that I didn't understand about the new movie is why is he not a flat-nosed Peterbilt? Why has he got that long-nosed Peterbilt? Why is Bumblebee a Camaro? He should be a bug. And why is Megatron a jet? He should be a gun. Um, that was the... Right? Transformer fans in the house are like, yeah, seriously. Why? What? They messed with the whole darn cartoon. They changed the whole story. But a transformer, right? They turn into whatever. They transform from one thing to another, from a robot to a car, right? From a car to an all-out killing machine, right? They transform from one thing to the next. My role as a Christian was to make it personal, and I didn't. I thought, my job was to judge everybody coming in the room and put myself above them because I was so self-centered. I had so much self-doubt, lack of self-confidence, right, that I would project my inner feelings onto somebody else to make myself feel better about my sin. I was conforming and not transforming. It wasn't personal to me. The Bible wasn't personal to me. It was a cool story. Cool story, bro. Cool story, bro. Awesome. Yeah, Jesus loves me. Cool, man. I can go live like sin. Sweet. He loved me anyway. No, no. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. And the more that I would transform, I would turn into the person I am today, the person standing before you that is speaking from personal experience, who has a personal relationship with the Father, who is on this connection with God every day. God, how can you change me into who you want me to be? How can you transform me? What is it today that I can do differently? Is now my prayer. At 25, it wasn't. At 25, I was posting blame on everybody else for the reason I am the way I am. Well, you know, my dad never told me he loved me, so there you go. I got daddy issues. Never told me he was proud of me. He always told me that he was better than me. It was always a competition that I didn't know I was competing in. That was my relationship with my dad. And I could make excuses on that's how come I behave the way I do instead of transforming into who God called me to be. For those of you that have a hard time relating to God the Father because you didn't have a good father as a figure, right? There's that song, You're a Good, Good Father. And some of us, that's a hurtful song. Because when we think about our fathers, some of us have had bad fathers, a bad example of a father. 
a father who maybe stepped out, a father maybe who wasn't there, a father who maybe beat you, a father who maybe never told you he loved you or was proud of you, only had negative things to say about you, who just put you down every single day of your life, who was disgusted by you, didn't want to be with you, didn't want to treat you good. Some of you, and then you come to church and you hear how God's our father, you're like, well, I don't want that father. I had one of those. But the more that I read the Bible, the more I see how good of a father God is. And that's who I want to be. I want to be modeled after that father, not my earthly father. Yeah, my earthly father was awesome. He was a pastor. He was great. He did some things wrong. He did some things that I probably wouldn't have done it the way he did it. But I'm not going to put all of my faults in a container and say, well, that's just the way I am because my upbringing, same way Brian's like, I'm not going to excuse that. I'm going to be like God. And it doesn't come by coming to church, sitting down in your rusty dusty for an hour, going home, and nothing changing. Because all you're going to do is end up conforming. Transformation happens on a daily basis. It happens all the time. It happens in what maybe for some of us is what we listen to, what we meditate on, who we listen to, where we're getting our information from. My wife asks me all the time, did you hear about the news? No, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for the news. She's like, well, you need to be informed. I was like, I need to be informed on other things. I don't have time. When am I going to watch the news, babe? When I'm 24 foot up on a ladder? Yeah, check out what's going on. No. She's like, well, you can listen to it. No. You know why? Because it's one person's perspective, and they're trying to create a narrative in my life on how I should think and behave. I don't need somebody else telling me that. I have it right here. I have it right here. The narrative that I'm supposed to believe is on my phone. It's called the Bible. Some of you, it's in your hand. The narrative that God has for your life is right here. But we're so busy letting other people tell us how we're supposed to think, how we're supposed to behave, how we're supposed to act, that we're not transforming into who God created us to be because it's on our shelf instead of in our hands. Some of us, there's things that we listen to, music we listen to. It drives me crazy. The music today, I don't understand it. Like, what? You, this isn't even music. I feel like my dad such an old man. Britney Spears come on, and he's like, that's not real music. And then he goes and puts on, like, the Beatles. I'm like, what is this, right? <laughs> what is this? Three Dog Night, average white band, average white band, though. That was killer music. Uh, he introduced me to cool music, like Styx. Oh, man, there were some good bands back then. Nowadays, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is such garbage. I tell my kids all the time, can you not play garbage on Alexa? That would be great. Come sometimes it's easy as just changing what you're listening to. Put on some worship music. I'm having a bad day. Instead of turning on what you're used to turning on to make you feel better, why don't you put on some worship music? Oh, I'm having a, it's a rough time in the house. Why don't you create a different atmosphere instead of the atmosphere you're used to creating? Transforming little things at a time. With my wife and I, it took two years to realize oh, snap, I'm supposed to communicate different with my wife. She's not my mom. Interesting. Interesting. It took a lot. There was a lot of rules I had to do. A lot of transforming. My whole thing with my 25-year-old self is, man, if you would just take the word, read the word, and apply the word, you would grow so much quicker into who God wanted you to be plan for your life? You want to know how you know God's will if you're in God's will or in God's plan for your life? Follow his ways. If you follow God's ways, you'll always end up in his will. Because his will never deviates from his ways. And his plan for your life will never deviate from his ways. So as long as I'm reading the Bible and I'm staying in step with his ways, I'll always end up in God's will. Oh, bro, you're a pastor in Hawaii. That's like the, like, that's normally like the pinnacle of ministry. You're a senior pastor, and you left to come to Bremerton? What? Lockstep with God. I felt my time there was done. I felt like he was moving on, moving me on to something else. Cool. I trained my whole life to be a senior pastor. I'm a professional window washer. Whatever. God can still use me. I'm still in his ways. I get to go to people that don't come to church's house every day. Do you understand how big my ministry can be? 
Do you understand, like, when you're there, it's like going to the hair stylist. I hate it, okay? The hair stylist that wants to talk to you while they're cutting your hair drives me crazy. I go to people's house, and I'm on the inside, and it's like free therapy, I guess, for them. So they'll follow me around, and they'll talk to me. I'm like, bro, you realize I don't get paid to talk to you. I get paid to wash your windows. And God's like, shh. following my ways you're ending up in my will she's trying to tell you that her husband lost his job would you just stop being a piece of garbage for a second and listen to this woman and pray for her and talk to her and be a Christian to her would you just stop for a second and transform a little bit into who I'm calling you to be I get stuff all the time I was at people's houses out in Driftwood Key. I don't know if you guys know where that is, but that's in Hansville. And point no point. Did you know that they had a major flooding this past winter? Did you see the video of the guy kayaking down the street to point no point? If you haven't been out to point no point, you can't drive out there anymore to the lighthouse. That road is gone. The parking lot's gone. I got to sit and pray with people whose homes got destroyed in that flood. Some people are like, oh, you left your calling. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm walking right in the will of God. And it's a thing in his ways. By not conforming, but transforming. By being who God called me to be. If at 25 I had done that, I'd be much further than I am today. My wife and I, our relationship would be much further than we are today. We have to put in some key rules, man. We're not going to go to bed angry. We got an issue. We don't go to bed till it's solved. If we do, we got to drop it. And we're not allowed to keep records of said fight. So when we're fighting, we're fighting about this issue right here. You're not allowed to bring up 10 years ago issue, bro. Nope. And we'll call each other on it. Oh, time out. Hold up. Illegal. Flag on the play. Done. You have just lost the fight. You have just lost. I'm telling you, it saved my marriage. You know what else saved my marriage? This. For those of you that don't know how to communicate because you're a stonewaller like me, when, you know, things go wrong, you don't, you, you don't want to talk. You just sit there. Then you're married to a babbling brook who just wants to talk about everything. My wife learned this one sentence for, uh, for those of you who have a stonewalling personality that you're dealing with. When you do this, it makes me feel this. Bye. You just ponder on that for a minute. One sentence changed our whole marriage. Hey, you know, when you lie to me about, about being at work, but you're at the basketball gym, it makes me really not trust you. And that's a legit story. And she just walked away. And I'm sitting there with all my thoughts going, you know what, I can't change that. She's not wrong. You take as much time as you need to think about that, I'll be in the other room waiting for you when you're ready to talk. Transforming. Constant. Our relationship now is good. We don't have the when you do this, it makes me feel this relationship because I talk to her now. We're in it together. I've transformed a little bit in my communication. 25-year-old me didn't get it. 25-year-old me, man, what a dirtbag. 25-year-old me, too full of himself. 40-year-old me looking back at him like, come on, man. We could have done so much better. We could have been so much better. We could have had such a deeper relationship with the Father. We could have been so much more blessed. And we were still blessed back then because we were walking in God's will, I guess, a little bit. But we could have been so much more at 25 if we took the word personal, if he made it his story to us, to me. Okay. Paul's writing this to the church in Rome. But this applies to me. I can make this personal. He also had one in Ephesians. If you want to just put that on the screen so I don't have to mess around. And we'll close with this. It's 11.02. I, I kept you long enough. Some of y'all are like, dude, I'm hungry. I know I get it. It says this in Ephesians chapter 4. This is out of the Message Bible. And so I insist, and God backed me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God but with reality itself.
can't think straight anymore. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. Keep going. Next screen. But that's no life for you. This is what, what I want you to take home. You learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in his truth, precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Let's put another slide. Yep. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, uh, of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Can I have uh, the band come back up? That's my cue. See how subtle that was? This is what I want to focus on. No, can you go back to that slide? It's the last one. Right here. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. This is where I want us to finish today. This would have been my last, my last thing to myself. Man, that old way has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. If I could tell my 25-year-old self anything, be like, bro, the way you're thinking, it's got to go. The way you're behaving, it's got to go. The way you're conducting yourself, it's got to go. It's rotten. It's no good for anything. Anybody ever have anything rotten at all in your life? It's okay. It's all good. Anybody have rotten milk ever? Yeah, disgusting. How many of y'all like, mm, guzzle that down? Mm -hmm. Yep, them chunks and all. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all keep that in your fridge? I know you teenagers do. You teenagers like, oh, yeah, that's bad. I know y'all do it. I know y'all do it. Because I did it when I was a teen too. Mom's got it. My mom's got it. It's all good. Nobody, nobody does. Come on. When you smell rotten milk, you're like, bro, that's disgusting. That's got to go. So we had these, we had these chickens. Uh, last story. We had these chickens last year. Okay, this is recent. We got these eggs. And I didn't know there's a way, a way to test rotten eggs. I usually buy store-bought eggs. Store-bought eggs normally tell you best used by this date, right? Farm eggs from your own house don't come with an expiration date, okay? I didn't realize that if you grabbed an egg, filled a glass with water, and dropped it inside, if it sank, it's good. If it floats, it's bad. I didn't know that, okay? I just washed it and cracked it open. It was the most disgusting thing I have ever smelt in my whole life. And that's saying a lot because I'm a dad of four teenage boys. That smelt worse than their bedroom. And you all know what it's like in their bedrooms. It was bad. It was bad. It like stunk up the whole house. It was black. The yolk was black. It was. But how many of y'all be like, mm, rotten egg, let me cook that up for you real quick. Mm. Eat it up. Rotten and all. No. You would chuck it. You would get rid of it. Anybody homeowners here or renters ever have rotten siding on the side of your house and you just left it? It's all good. Weather will take care of that. Yeah, it will. It will end up in your house. Got to get rid of it. Got to get rid of it to make room for new. Nobody wants rotten eggs. Nobody drinks spoiled milk unless you're ridiculous. Nobody wants rotten siding on their house. Well, how come when it comes to our life, the house that is supposed to be housing the Holy Spirit, why do we let rotten things stay around? Just a, it's just a little bit of spoiled milk. It's fine. It's just a little bit of rot in that foundation. It's fine. It's just, it's just a little bit of rotten egg smell in there. It's okay. It'll wash out. But that's supposed to house the Holy Spirit. Our hearts, our lives. It said, get rid of it. It's rotten. It's no good. It's unable to be used. It's unable to be consumed. Get rid of it. Then take on an entirely new way of life. I like that it says new way of life, not a new life, because some of y'all come here like, oh, I accepted Jesus, new life, key. New way of life. It's not about attending church. It's about being different. It's about transforming and not conforming. It's about getting rid of what's rotten in your life to make room for more. 
My 25-year-old self, he didn't get that. He didn't understand it. This is what I would tell him, bro, there's a lot of rot going on in your life. And you know that rot spreads, right? Yeah, I know. Because I'm a homeowner. And I realize that one rotted piece of wood can turn, turn into a lot of rotted pieces of wood. It expands. It grows. Get rid of it to make room for a new way of life. Hey, bro, 25-year-old Koa, you stink, bro. You smell rotten. It's time to get rid of those habits and transform into who God created you to be. For some of you, maybe in this room, you're in that point in your Christian walk where it's just a routine or it's just a thing you do. It's not a way of life. You're doing church. You're not being a church. It's just a way of, of doing things that you're, you're just caught in this cycle on repeat over and over again, like how I was when I was 25, super self-absorbed, super self-indulged, super selfish, all about me, not about what God wants me to be. And it's two different things. Because what God has for you is so much greater and better than what you could have ever planned for yourself. So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, man, why do we do that? Hold up, hold up, hold up. That drives me crazy. I'm not going to ask you to do something I can't do, okay? Like I said, I played the church game, okay? Okay? Whenever my dad said every eye closed and every head bowed. But why is that? I never see in the Bible that Jesus is like, all right, I'm going to do the altar call, every head head. Bow, eyes closed. And then I wouldn't even say it right half the time. Every head closed and eye bowed. I don't even know how to do that. But I'm not going to make you do something that I can't even do. And it doesn't make sense to me sometimes. I feel like we are so secret service oriented in our ministry that we forget that if you need Jesus, it's a celebratory thing. It's amazing. It's your first step into a new way of life. To me, everybody should be celebrating that. And it takes guts to serve Jesus. You want to know why? Because nobody will agree with you that knew you in your past. They'll be like, yeah, whatever, bro. Cool story. You go to church. Woo. Holy now, huh? Holy. Mm. I knew you before, bro. It takes guts. It's a commitment. You know, what I, what I view it as, sorry, tangent, but what I view it as is on a wedding day, right? When the bride comes up, when the bride comes up to the wedding platform, the minister doesn't say every eye closed and every head bowed, right? Right? Normally, everybody rises and their whole attention is put on the bride, right? And then you stand up before everybody and you say your vows, right? It's funny that in church, if you want to be saved, look up at me. If you want to be saved, raise your hand. Just stay up here right where you're at. It's cool. We don't even know who got saved. Maybe you text them when we're done. Maybe you don't. We don't, we don't know who actually made the commitment to follow Jesus. But to me, it's a celebratory thing. We're making a vow to God that we are committing our life to him. It is huge. It is monumentous. It is amazing. And sometimes our lives don't change because nobody knew we said that prayer anyway. Nobody knows the vow I just made. It's cool. So I can keep on conforming. As long as I come to church, we're good. Instead of transforming into a life. And what you don't realize is it's not a shameful thing. Every person in here that made that commitment to Jesus is now your brother and your sister and is going to walk through life with you. It is amazing. The commitment we make to say, hey God, that rotten thing, I don't need it anymore. I don't want it anymore. I'm going to stand by with fellow Christians, with fellow people who are like-minded as me that are going to help me transform and help me keep this vow I'm making to enter into a new life with you. It is amazing. It is awesome. It is huge. And it should be celebrated. Is that cool? So today, with every head open, and every eye looking around, right? Head open, head up. 
head open, yeah. Head up, eye looking around. If we could all just stand. We'll do it this way. Let's all just stand. And maybe you've been like me, my 25-year-old self, and I'm talking to you today about transforming, about getting rid of rotten things, things that are spoiling your relationship with the Father. Maybe you've been con conforming to the world and not being transformed by the renewing of your mind, by walking things out with Jesus. Maybe you are still like me, that 25-year-old boy who thought he knew everything and had it all together but really didn't, that needed Jesus. This morning, if that's you, and you want to be, you want to take that first step towards entering into a new life with Christ, that new life, that God way of life, that God way of living, I want to invite you to come down to the front. I'm only going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not those crazy preachers that will ask you to do one thing and then they tell you to do five things. I'm going to ask you to do two things. The first thing is if that's you, which I believe there may be some people in here that this resonated with you, that you're just going through the motions, but you want to do things different. I'm going to invite you to come to the front, if that's you, on the count when, when, when I say. And now I'm just going to say a prayer. You're going to repeat it after me. Two things. If that's you this morning, you're tired of being where you're at, you're tired of conforming, you didn't really understand it, you don't understand why you're doing it, but there's some rotten things in your life that you want to get rid of. You want to start on a new journey with Christ today. If that's you, I'm going to invite you to the front in three, two, one, if that's you. I got two, I got two other calls today. That's the first one. It's cool. I just figured I wasn't doing my due diligence if I didn't throw it out there. Hey, let's go. Give them a hand, guys. That's how we do it. <laughs> Bang. One. Let's go. You can stand here. You don't have to face them. You can face me because they're scary, bro. Seriously. They've been staring at me all day. I'm like, oh, we need to finish. We can say this prayer first. Everybody can repeat after me. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for me. I believe that he came, that he washed away my sin, that he died for me and rose again. Jesus, come live in me. Holy Spirit, fill me with your power, your wisdom, and your grace. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go. Hey, Frank, I'm going to ask you real quick. Would you mind just talking to Corbin about what just happened? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Would you mind, like after or whatever? Second altar call. That was one. That was rad. Guys, it is our job to walk with Corbin, okay? It's our job to lift him up, to encourage him, to spur him on to good works. It's our job to walk with him through it all. Second altar call today. I went way long. I'm sorry for your kids who are downstairs and my wife who's watching them. She understands. She knew it was me today. Second altar call. Hey, this is for those of us. I believe that God's here today. He wants to deal with some things that are in, inside of us. And there may be some rotten things that we've been holding on to. I had another illustration I was going to use today, but I decided not to. Backpack full of bricks, right? And a lot of times we want God, we're carrying around these burdens, these garbage, this back, this back issues. Like I, I, I could still be holding on to 25-year-old garbage. I, I'm not. I got rid of that. I tore it out. But a lot of times we want God to take things and we'll come up to an altar call like this one, full of rot or full of bricks. And and we'll ask God to help us. Like, we're going to lay this at the altar. You ever hear that? Bring it up and lay it at the altar. And we'll put our backpack down full of our bricks, or we'll tear out our rotted whatever. We're like, yeah, God, like, I really want this to happen. And then as soon as we say amen, we pick back up those bricks, and we walk back outside with them. We pick back up all the rot, all the spoiled milk, all the rotten eggs, pile them all back in our life because we're afraid because our identity is there in that filth, in that rot, in those bricks. Our upbringing's there. Our old way of doing things are there. All the narratives that we've believe, been believing over our life are there. Like my dad telling me, 
oh, bro, you're leaving your calling? That was his one thing to me when I left Hawaii. You're leaving your calling? No, I'm answering a new one. Answering, I'm just answering a new one, and I'm going to leave that there. But some of you, your identity is caught up, and it's at war with who God wants you to be because it's taking up all the room. My second altar call today is for those of us maybe who are still holding on to the rot and the spoil. And some of us, it's not our failures. Some of us, it's our success. Sometimes success is more deadly to a person than failure because we have it all or we've had it all or we've seen God move in a certain way so we want him to move that way again. Today, the altar is open for those of you who maybe have some rot, some spoiled milk, some spoiled eggs, maybe have some bricks, and you're saying, I want to leave that today. I want to pray for you. If that's you today, maybe you are my 25-year-old self with all the rot and spoil and nasty, and I want to pray that God would pour out his spirit on you so you can enter into the life that he has for you. I pray that he would rip out and remove that spoiled, rotted, nasty stuff remove those bricks from you, but then you got to leave it here and not take it with you. Is that cool? So today, if that's you, altar's open. I'm going to have them sing. You guys can come up. I'm not going to pray over the mic. I'm going to pray for you individually down here. If that's you this morning, the altar is open. We can take a minute. They'll sing during the song. If that's you, you can come up. And I believe that God wants to do some work in your hearts and in your lives today. Oh, I closed my eyes at one and there was a lot more that came up. God is doing some things. God, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're here with us. We thank you for Corbin coming to Jesus. We thank you for the others that have laid their burdens here at the altar, the rot, the nasty. But God, we also pray that you would fill us as we leave to not just have a Holy Ghost goosebump and say that was great, but to live the life that you called us to live to transform into new creations and new creatures, to be in your way and your will so that we end up in the plan that you have for us. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. We love you guys. You guys have a great week. Frank is going to be up next week. My good friend Frank is going to be good. You're going to want to be here. Also, youth tonight from 6 to 8.30. It's going to be fun. I promise. We love you all. Have a great week. See you next time.